Amen. All right, we're here in Genesis chapter number 13, verse number 1. Genesis 12, of course, ended with <clears throat> Abraham, or Abram at this point, going into the land of Canaan, the promised land. And then, at that time, there arose a great famine. This famine arose, and then Abram immediately fled, and he went into Egypt. When he went into Egypt, he told his wife, Sarai, at that point. She's not uh, referred to yet as Sarah. God has not changed her name yet as well. He tells her, you know, not to say that you are my wife. Just say that you're my sister. They get there, and, uh, you know, the Pharaoh takes his wife and almost commits some act, or maybe did, you know, uh, God forbid, commit a, a terrible act, the act of adultery with her. And then at this point, you know, uh, you know he, he receives back his wife. He takes the things, the possessions that were given unto him, and then he departs. So we see where he goes here in verse number 1. Genesis chapter number 13, verse number 1, we pick back up there. It says this, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. Into the south excuse me. So we find out also that Lot is still with Abram. He wasn't mentioned there for a period of time. And we see here it says that when he came out of Egypt, that Lot was coming with him. That means that he went into Egypt with Lot, and then he came out of Egypt with Lot. Look at verse number two. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. I strongly believe that, <coughs> excuse me, all the riches that he has at this point were riches that he obtained while he was in Egypt. These riches are not mentioned until this point here. There's also something uh, a, a little later in this chapter that causes me to believe that also. But I believe that the majority of his riches, has, at, at least, came while he was in Egypt. Number one, we saw, as I just mentioned last week, where he receives the riches from uh, Pharaoh because he is entreating him well for his wife's sake. So those could be a large portion of the riches that he was given. That makes perfect sense. Now, I want you to look at verse number three, and then we'll glean something from these first three verses. It says this, And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. Now, what does Egypt in the Bible represent? <coughs> the world bondage, right? Uh, you know, being in slavery, you know, uh, to the law, right? Of course, we see that all throughout the Bible. This is in many, many different cases. When there's a famine that arises, oftentimes, you know, uh, uh, people will go into Egypt. Sometimes, uh, like in the case with, with uh, when you see Jesus being taken there, you know, but there are other times, many times, where people will actually go into Egypt. You know, it's never mentioned to be within God's will, like this being a case where he actually tells, God tells Abram to go into Canaan, and then God never says, hey, leave Canaan. We see Abram just flee into Egypt, being a picture of a Christian going into the world. Now, where was he before he went into Egypt? Where does it say that he was? Does anyone remember? It tells you right here that he went back, right? It says... Verse 3, and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where, he, where his tent had been at the beginning. So he was in Bethel, and what was he doing in Bethel? He was calling upon the name of the Lord. That's mentioned, him calling upon the name of the Lord. And it says that he was there where the altar is located. So this is a lot of, of spiritual things that are related to Bethel. Now, where is, you know, where do you receive a lot of your, what location do you receive a lot of your, you know, your, your spirituality? Obviously, we get it from the Bible, but what location? Church. church, right? Well, Bethel is a perfect picture of the church, of God's house. I want to show you something really interesting. Turn to Genesis chapter number 28. Genesis chapter number 28. Now, <coughs> keep your hand here, of course, because we're going to be, we're going to be uh, uh, continually going through Genesis 13. Uh, you look there in Genesis chapter number 28. I'll read to you from Genesis 13 verse 4. We'll read this again in a moment. And we see what I just mentioned repeated. This came from Genesis 12, 8. It's repeated here again. When he comes to Bethel, it says this. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now look at Genesis chapter number 28. What the Bible says in Genesis 28. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 16. And Jacob awoke out of his sleep. So now this is speaking of Jacob, of course. This is Abram's grandson. And Jacob awoke out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord <coughs> is in this place, and I knew it not. So this is somewhere where the Lord is, right? Verse 17, and he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other 
but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Verse 18, And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it and called the name of that place Bethel. Now watch why it's called Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that, I, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar, watch what it says, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So I want you to notice it's mentioned two different times. But he says in verse number 17, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. You see the city that he's specifically uh, referring to in verse 19, and he called the name of that place Bethel. That's extremely interesting. So when you go back to Genesis chapter number uh, 13, you see Abram being a type or of a Christian. He's not saved yet. We went over that. He's not, uh, you know, believed on the Lord yet and received his righteousness, but he's in a place where he's calling on the name of the Lord. He's in a place where there's an altar located, a spiritual place, right? He looks like he's in the will of God. What does he look like? He looks like a Christian that is walking in the spirit, doesn't he? But then what do you see happen? He leaves and he goes to Egypt. What does Egypt picture? The world. What does he do in Egypt? He sins, doesn't he? But then what happens in Genesis chapter number 13, verse number 3? He goes back to Bethel, a picture of a Christian going back to church, returning back to the spiritual life. That's extremely interesting. The Bible is an amazing book. It truly is. And you see the name of that place? What is it? It's, it's called the house of God. So where is he going back to? The house of God. He's leaving the world, and he's returning back to the house of God. <coughs> so he says again in verse number 4, Under the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. This is the same altar. It was still there when he got back to it. And then it says, And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. I want to remind you again that Abram has not <coughs> received salvation yet. Again, let's look over. Just look at Genesis 15 once again. This may be a new thought to you, so I want you to see it again. Genesis 15, verse 6, is actually where, where Abram's salvation, where he receives his salvation, it says in verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So when he's calling on the name of the Lord, he's not, this is not you know, him getting saved. Now, people do get saved at the moment that they call, uh, call on the name of the Lord, but that is, it is the faith that's saving them. That is proof that you can call on the name of the Lord and not be saved. I went over that last, I went over that last week. Michaela, honey. Will you give me a drink of water? As I mentioned, I'm not feeling real well. I've been real sick to my stomach all day, so I'm going to try to make this as interesting as possible to everybody. But uh, so we see here, you know, an example of someone calling on the name of the Lord and not being saved. This is the per we see this in many people. Pentecostals will say, you know, I prayed that prayer already. Sometimes they'll tell you that, right? But what's missing? They prayed that prayer, but they didn't have the right belief. They, were, they weren't fully trusting in Jesus. You can pray that prayer and at that moment not be putting all of your faith in Jesus. What saves you is the belief. That's why he says he believed on the Lord and he counted him for righteousness. So we see him again calling on the name of the Lord again when he's not saved yet. So that's that, you know, this, te this can teach us what it means and, and uh, you know, what the Bible's talking about when they call upon the name of the Lord. Not to, you know, have another side note real quick, but... Uh, when the kids are playing afterwards, I meant to do this in the announcements, but like I said, I'm not feeling well, so my mind is everywhere. Right here, this, this is starting to swell up more. I'm getting ready to fix it. I did a lot of construction here the other day. I'm getting ready to fix that, so let make sure that the kids are careful. I've seen a, a few children almost trip on that a few times. It's swelling up more. I don't know if someone spilled something or what's going on, but I'm going to have to you know, repair a couple of pieces of laminate. When it got, started getting more humid recently, they started swelling up a little bit more. So probably something got spilled, but no big deal. I'll fix that later. Back to the sermon. So verse number 5, let's look at the sermon. Or look at the, the, the chapter here again, Genesis 13, look at verse number 5. It says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. I firmly believe that Lot also uh, obtained uh, all of these possessions while he was in Egypt. The, none of these things were mentioned prior. Another reason why I believe that is verse number 6. It says this, And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great. So that they could not dwell together. Now, nothing like this is spoken of prior. 
But you, we do see you know, Abram being given things from Pharaoh. We see him leave Egypt. <coughs> we see it spoken of that he has great riches, which was not mentioned prior. We see Lot being spoken of having great riches, which were not mentioned prior. And then also on top of that, Abram and Lot now all of a sudden are not able to dwell together. So that implies to me that these great riches came from where? Came from Egypt. So this would be a picture of the, 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 the possessions of the world. Egypt picturing the world, this would be a, a, you know, uh, a picture of the things of the world. And we know the Bible tells us to love not the world, but it doesn't stop there. It says love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, I want you to look at what the result of all of these riches, all of these possessions, all of these things comes to. Look at verse number <coughs> 7. It says this. And there was a strife between the herdmen <coughs> of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwell then in the land. So, we see that... You know, uh, the herdmen, the, the, you know, the, the men that are responsible for herding all of Abram's cattle and Lot's cattle, they start arguing because there's, uh, they're obviously, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, kind of mixing and mangling. And then they start, you know, arguing about what's what and where their line is and, you know, all of that. They're getting into to a debate about it to some extent. Look at verse number uh, eight now. And Abram said unto Lot, <coughs> let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee. And between my herdmen and thy herdmen, and then he says, for we be brethren. Now, there's a lot of good that we can learn from that attitude that Abram has right there. A lot of good, really. You know, uh, we see, number one, that <coughs> Abram is being a peacemaker. He does not want them to be fighting, right? He doesn't want them arguing. The Bible talks about the, the peacemaker. I believe that they're referred to as being, the, they'll be called the children of God. You know, so the children of God should be peacemakers. So here we see Abram at the very beginning, <coughs> he's being responsible. He's trying to, to bring peace in a situation where there's strife. He's trying to make them get along. But the most important thing is why. Why is he trying? Why is he saying? What is the most important, you know, what or what is the, 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 the main reason why they should get along and they shouldn't fight? What's the reason? For we are brethren. Isn't that something we can apply to us today as being brethren, as being brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, uh, being of the family of God? If we start fighting over something, normally it's always silly, it's stupid things, right? You know what attitude we should have? The attitude Abram had. We should be the one that's responsible, like Abram, too. We should stop and say, hey, let us, let's not fight over this. Why? Because we're brethren. What does that teach you? That Abraham understood that brethren should not be fighting. That brethren should be getting along. Brethren should be, why? Unity. We should have unity. We all have the same spirit. We all have the same Lord. We all have the same book. So th these things should bring unity. You should have more unity with the people in this church than you do with anyone. With anyone, you should have more in common with the people that are saved, with the people that are the children of God, than anyone. It shouldn't matter what you know, you know, uh, you know, ethnicity, what nationality. It shouldn't matter anything like that. Where you know, where you're from, what you know, whether you're in the you know the army, the Marines, none of that should matter, right? What should matter the most? Who you should really get along with the best is brethren. But let me say this. Strife will occur. You know what you need to do? You need to have this attitude. You need to keep that in mind. So people know these principles, but then when things happen, then all of a sudden they forget them. And then they're mad and then they're arguing. You need to be responsible. You need to be able, even when these things are happening, to be able to step back and be responsible and say, hey, we shouldn't be fighting. Keep in mind. Why? Because we're brethren. Because we should have unity. That's important. Let's look at verse number, <coughs> verse number 9. It says this. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the, the left <coughs> hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Now, if, we, if we're looking at this as in, like, typology, if we're looking at this as in, you know, as we saw earlier, we're trying to keep the same, uh, uh, you know, the same streamline of thought of the type of Abraham coming from the church, going to the world. And then what does he come back out with? Looks like the things of the world. Lot comes back out with the things of the world. He went in, you know, uh, you know, uh, a Christian. He went in, obviously he came back out a Christian too. But he went in a Christian. He went in walking in the spirit. And he came back out of Egypt a Christian. But you know what? He brought things with him. He brought possessions with him. And where did they come from? The world. What happens immediately when he gets all those things? Him and Lot start fighting over the things. A lot of people think, you know, we have this mindset that's pushed on us. 
you know, of covetousness, where the world just tries to get you to be covetous, to just to desire more. You know what will make you happy? More things. But you know what happened immediately when they got things? When they got the things of the world specifically, what happened? Strife. Immediately. And you know, Abram tried to do the right thing. He tried to. He knew, hey, we shouldn't be fighting. But you know what? I believe that when we're looking at this in type, that he made a bad decision here. Because what did he do? He said, hey, we don't want to fight. Did he say, hey, let's, let's get rid of some of this stuff? You know, this stuff's the problem. Let's get this out of here. Let's work something out so that we can stay together. What did he say? You got too much. I have too much. You know, this is in type, of course. Let's keep our stuff. You just go over there and I'll stay here. I think that's the right attitude. It, it pictures his priorities being wrong is what it pictures. It pictures him choosing his stuff over his brethren. In any, you know, any way that you look at this, you know, him and Lot, his son-in-law, who was obviously following him, and I'm sure, and we know later, needed Abram to be a good example to him because what happened to him? And what does he do? You just go there and I'll stay here. Why? What's the whole reason why? Because they have all this stuff. So what is he doing almost? Choosing the stuff over his son-in-law, over guiding and helping his son-in-law, you know, uh, trying to mentor his son-in-law. What, or what is he doing? Not his son-in-law, I'm sorry, his nephew. What is his, what is his nephew doing? His nephew's following him everywhere he goes. He goes into Egypt with him, and you know what? This is another example, I've spoken of this before, of how you can cause problems in other people's lives because they're following you places too. Abraham didn't only come out with the things of the world. Do you know who else did? Why? Both of them did. Do you know why? Because he was just following Abram. He went, he left with Abram. He left with Terah. And when Terah died, Abram took Lot with him. He went to Canaan, went down into Egypt. Lot came with him. They came out. Lot came with him. You can, it's, a, it's clearly that Lot, it's clear that Lot is following Abram, isn't he? You know what? So he wasn't only negatively impacting himself when he went down into Egypt during the famine. He went out down into the world and he carried worldly things out with him. What did, what did Lot do as well? well he, he got worldly things too, didn't he? Took them out and what did they cause? Did it make their lives happier? No, it actually caused brethren to, to separate. And that can ha happen sometimes. People, you can become envious at other brothers and sisters in Christ, things that they have, and in your heart you'll separate from them. Because you, you just have this bad attitude when you see him because you're just so envious, you're just like, oh, he thinks he's better than me. He doesn't really think he's better than me. You know, you shouldn't be minded on, on things of this world in the first place. Man. If someone has a nice car, someone has a nice, you know, in this in this church, it's not a nice car, it's a nice van. We're like coming that van. Like, oh, man. He thinks he's better than me because he's got that 15 passenger. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so... We shouldn't be, you know, uh, desirous of all these other things that, that other people have. And that definitely shouldn't cause you to, like, hate your brother in your heart. You know, a lot of the things that you're thinking, he's not thinking. A lot of the things maybe that you're dreaming up in your own, your own mind about maybe when you're envious about these people. It's all just your imagination running crazy. Because, you know, covetousness can make you think and act crazy. It really can. You know, uh, being, being uh, envious about things that other people have, that's wrong. And that can, that can take you very, it all, you know, all sin can, but there are certain sins that will take you a lot farther. Certain sins that will, you know, cause division between people. So that's what we see right here. What did it cause? Division. We see the worldly things, things of the world is causing division between brethren. And it was really a result of Abram, in this case, bringing Lot with him, and Abram and, and Lot seeing Abram's bad example, so he just does the same thing. Look at, uh, look at verse number 10. It says this. <coughs> and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, if thou comest. Under Zoar. You know, this, this on the same topic makes me think of the exact same thing. Was Sodom a, a, a wholesome city? No. Was Sodom a good city uh, as far as morals or anything along those lines? It was a terrible city, wasn't it? We're going to get to this in just a moment, briefly. But it was a horribly wicked, evil city. But when you looked at it, how did it look? It looked nice, didn't it? Kind of like New York City. How does New York City look? It looks nice. It's nice to look at, isn't it? You know, a lot of things, it looks like it's, you know, you can, you can tell there's a lot of money there, can't you? There's a lot of flashing lights. What is it? It's enticing to the flesh. It's enticing to the eyes. What did Sodom look like? Even the Bible tells you that it even has the garden of the Lord. Like, this is a beautiful, beautiful place, isn't it? What was the reason why Eve ended up sinning? She looked at 
the, you know, the fruit. I just said apple. It's so stuck in my head. It may have been apple. We don't know. But it, she looked at the fruit, and what did she do? She lusted after it. She saw that it was good for food. Where did it start? With the eyes. Where did Lot start? He looked, and he said, man, that's nice, isn't it? He said, that's real nice. Wasn't that the reason why? He saw, it says, look at the exact same uh, you know, uh, uh, explanation. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld. It's the same as, as, as Eve seeing, isn't it? And beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. <coughs> so we see that Sodom beforehand was a beautiful place, wasn't it? You know, New York looks nice. You know, L.A. looks nice. Las Vegas looks nice. But those are stinking dens of iniquity. They are horribly disgusting. You know, there are, you know, I'm sure, higher rates of STDs and higher rates of diseases, higher rates of, you know, uh, cocaine and drug addiction, drunkenness, sicknesses on all levels, all of these different types of things. But when you look at it, if you're flying over top of all the cities in the United States, I bet Las Vegas from the, the bird's eye view looks pretty cool, doesn't it? All the lights just shining and flashing and stuff. Your children, you don't think that they would be like, man, that looks cool, Dad. You can't see. All you can see is just the lights from up there. What do you think they would say? It looks like a carnival, doesn't it? It's enticing to the flesh. Sodom was enticing to the flesh when he looked at it. This is, it looks nice. Do you know what? It's disgusting when you get inside. Mm -hmm. It's filthy when you get inside. It's horrible when you get inside. And, and sin is very, you know, um, it's very deceitful as well. It'll deceive you. It looks like, oh, this will be fun. But the end thereof is death. It's not, it's, you know, it's, you know, it may be, you may have pleasure, <coughs> but the pleasure only lasts for a season. You ultimately reap the wages, and the wages are death. You ultimately, you know, uh, find out that it's nothing like the experience doesn't result anything like how it looked in the beginning. So that's that's always how people are enticed with sin. It's always it always begins with their eyes. It always begins with what they see. <coughs> so look there in uh, <coughs> verse number eleven. It says, "Then Lot chose him all the plain of, <coughs> of Jordan." Excuse me. And Lot journeyed east, and they separate themselves. Look at this. The one. From the other. Notice how there's emphasis on that. That's what made, caused me to notice this, because it says they separated themselves, the one from the other. Does that sound like it's it's telling you that there's something good that just happened? Does it sound like it's subtly saying this wasn't good? It, how did it end up? I mean, look at it from that example too. Look well, from that perspective. It didn't end up well, did it? When two brethren separate like that, Lot obviously needed Abram. It wasn't good that they separated one from another. They separated one from the other, and it was all because of the possessions that they had. Of course, and not a good reason. Now, and then it tells you right after that, it says this. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Notice how it's saying, this was fine for Abram, but how was it for Lot? Because look at the very next verse. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So it tells you, as a result of this, it did not end up well for Lot. Saying this was not a good decision. This was not a good separation. Now, one thing that we can learn from verse number 13 is this. It says, but the men of Sodom <coughs> were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. People say all sin is equal. You know, all sin is equal. You know, it doesn't matter whether you, and you can make up the most ridiculous thing. It doesn't matter whether you steal a pencil or whether you mass murder 50 people. So all, all sins equal, brethren. You know that that's not true in your mind. You realize that that sounds ridiculous and crazy. But you know what? That Even if that did sound ridiculous and crazy to you, but the Bible said something different, well, then your logic would be wrong. But the reason why it sounds crazy is because it is crazy, and God's not the author of confusion. And we have a conscience, and we can understand. And when we look at the Bible, what does the Bible teach? This is the most important thing. It just bolsters that. It shows it is crazy. Look at what it says. Look at what this is teaching. But the men of Sodom were wicked. And then it says this. And sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So what is that doing? That is showing you that they are sinners in a greater degree than other people, aren't they? That whatever sin that they're committing, these people and what sin that they are in is not the same as the, as the average person when God looks around. Do you understand that? They're sinners before the Lord. They're wicked, and they're sinners before the Lord 
exceedingly. We're going to look at a couple of verses here <coughs> quickly. Go to, uh, go to Genesis 20, chapter 20, verse 9. Genesis chapter 20, verse 9. We're going to look at about four verses here. I'm going to show you even further that this is taught all throughout the Bible. That, what was Genesis 20, verse 9, wasn't it? Shoot. Yeah, it is, it is. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom? Look at this. A great sin. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. So notice what he says. What does great mean? What does great in the Bible mean? What is the, 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 the perfect synonymous word today that we would use for great? What would you say? Large. Yeah, yeah, that's what he's saying. He's saying great sin like so large of a sin, right? So if you're saying that something is large of a sin, can all sin be equal? It's not possible. You could not have a large sin and a small sin if all sin was equal. We're they're not equal in you know uh, in, in 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 size in the sense of how bad that they are in the degree of how wicked they are. Some sins are 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 more exceedingly wicked than others. And we see here that this sin it says so great a sin. Okay, I'm going to show you another example of this one exactly, or, or this statement, the same statement exactly. Go to Exodus chapter 32, verse 21. Exodus chapter 32, verse number <coughs> 21. <clears throat> and Moses said unto Aaron, that's verse 21, as I said, Exodus 32. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Notice, so great a sin upon them. He said, What did they do unto you that you caused such a poor, like a a massive sin to be brought upon them. And how does Moses act here? He's extremely upset, isn't he? Why? Because this is not a small sin. This is a great sin. This is a big sin. That's why you see God in the Old Testament and the New Testament reacting differently to different sins. That's why when your children transgress you, if they do something small, you are not as mad as if they did something huge. Why? Because there are small sins and there are big sins. They are not the same. How does Moses act? He breaks the, the, the Ten Commandments. Why? Because this is what they're doing is exceeding wicked. It's horrible. They're you know, committing fornication. They're worshiping this, this, this idol. And, and he ends up making them drink the calf that they had made out of a straw, the gold, which we know is not good for you. Why is he doing all this to them? Because what they did was serious. That's why God will give huge punishments for some sins, and then God won't punish people near as bad for other sins, will he? All throughout the Bible, we see, this, we see the Bible talk about a greater damnation. Why? Because there are greater sins. You see the sins in the Bible that are great sins? Well, they're going to receive a great damnation when people get to hell. They're gonna, the, the, the sins that people commit that are small sins, you know what's going to happen? They'll receive smaller punishments for that. God is just, and God knows what's small, what's great, and then the end of their life, he looks at your life, and he can see in totality what punishment that you deserve at that point because he is an all-knowing God. Look, it doesn't end here. I want you to go to uh, 2 Kings 17, 21. This is spoken of repeatedly. There's no way that a person could say that all sin is equal. 2 Kings 17, I believe, verse 21. <coughs> For he rent Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nabat king. And Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord and made them sin. Does it stop there? Because he could stop there, couldn't he? Think about that. He could just say, and made them sin, couldn't he? But it's not only just the sin. He wants to tell you something. He says, and made them sin a great sin. A big sin. A large sin. Go to John. This is one you guys are familiar with, I'm sure. Go to John chapter 19, verse 11. John chapter number 19, verse number 11. Obviously, <coughs> You know, the first statement was from Abimelech there in Genesis. The, the next statement was from Moses. That statement we just read in 2 Kings was from the Holy Spirit. So somebody could try to argue, well, they thought, you know, Moses thought there were greater sins. Abimelech thought there were greater sins. But what about the Holy Spirit in 2 Kings 17? The Holy Spirit tells you they send a great sin. But not only that, right here in John chapter number 19, we have the Lord himself, God in the flesh, standing here. And he says in verse number 11, when he's given to Pilate, he's speaking to Pilate, he says this, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. 
Therefore he that delivered me unto thee, watch what it says, hath the greater sin. Saying that, that <coughs> those that brought Jesus to Pilate committed a worse or greater sin than Pilate himself committed. Greater, great, you know, these words are, are called superlatives in language. Super means like above, right? Beyond, above, it's up here. Super, like a superintendent, right? He's the one at the top. So a superlative, is, the lative is, is, is like the word related, saying how these words correspond to one another. Saying there are two words, and this word greater is a super word. It's up here, it's greater than the word below it. What would be the word below it other than, you know, uh, uh, below great? Well, we wouldn't use that word, but let's use this as an example. Best. What would be the word, you know, that would be below best, that's not as high as best? We would say better or good. You understand how, how the, what it's doing is it's saying that there is more than one word. How are these words related? But it is superlative. That's what the lative comes from. Talking about how these words correspond with one another. So this word is related to this word, but it's greater. How is it related it, to this word? It's greater than this word because uh, it is a greater sin than just a normal sin or an average sin. So it, this word alone in grammar, if you just look at grammar and this being the type of word that it is, being a superlative, that tells you, that's what that word means, that, that one is greater than the other. One is more than the other, and these people have committed a greater sin. Do you know why people today try to act like all sin is equal? Because they have an agenda. Because they want certain sins that are not accepted by society that are horribly disgusting, evil, evil sins just to be you know, accepted by other people. All sins equal. Why would someone try to convince you that a horrible, just, just wicked, disgusting sin is the same as this other sin over here? Why? Because they don't want you judging that the way in which it should be judged. They don't want you to treat that the way in which it should be treated. What, are they, what types of things do they say when they say that? Well, you're a sinner too and all sins equal. It's like, what in the world? Have you lost your mind? It is so crazy that people have this attitude. All sin is equal. You know without a shadow of a doubt that you get more mad when your child transgresses against you when he does Worse things. You realize this throughout our daily lives. You know that a guy that kills someone deserves a greater punishment than a person that's smoking pot or that's doing whatever. That's doing anything like that, right? You know that these are different. They're not the same. And we sound like idiots when Christians say they're all sins equal. You sound like an idiot. You sound crazy. You really do. Amen. But this is the agenda. And it's what's right here in Genesis chapter number 13. Genesis chapter number 13. The first time you are told when one sin is worse than another. Look at what it says in Genesis 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked. Does that sound like just a normal sin? No, that's strong language, isn't it? They're wicked. And then look what it says. And sinners... <coughs> When God looks at them, they are sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I want you to look at Genesis 18, 20. Look again at this. Genesis chapter number 18, verse number 20. Probably a few of these maybe that you never noticed. Verse 20. And the Lord said, <coughs> because the cry, <coughs> excuse me, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah <coughs> is great. Now watch this. And because their sin is very grievous. Why did God come down there and give them the punishment that he gave them? Because what they were doing did not deserve just a small punishment. What they were doing was horrible. It was wicked. It was exceeding sinful. Exceedingly sinful. They were exceeding before the Lord. They were sinners exceedingly before the Lord when he looked down there. They were not just, stop saying that all sin is equal. Stop saying, you don't, you are going to warp your mind and you are not going to understand justice. You're going to live, a, if you really believe that, you would live a weird life is what you would live. If you really believe that principle, you would just go around, just, oh, it doesn't matter whether I commit adultery on my wife or I steal something. Or, it, that's crazy and that's nonsense. Right. And it's because people are pushing an agenda to make you accept horrible, wicked sins. Like homosexuality. That is not normal. That is not just a regular sin. That is not like, you know, you know, if someone just takes something from a grocery store. 
That it's not like if someone just, you know, uh, punches someone in the face or smites someone. Those are not the same things. The Bible talks about, the Bible is closely linked over and over again with the Bible. It, well, in the Bible with reprobate. Over and over again, sodomites and reprobates. Homosexuals and reprobates. Whatever your opinion about that subject is, I don't care. But if you look up reprobates, the type of people that are reprobates, do you know what comes up over and over and over again? Homosexuality, people that are sodomites. You know, you see God doing, what is he doing here? He just wipes a complete city off the map. He does not give them a preacher that's sent there to help them. He does not give them a second opportunity. He looks down, and they are sinners, and they're wicked, and he says, exceedingly, and then he says that the sin is very grievous. It's not a normal sin. It's extremely wicked, so wicked that God says, I'm gonna, I am going to burn every one of you with fire and brimstone. Tell me another time in the Bible when God destroys someone supernatural with the same exact punishment that's in hell. Think about that for a few minutes. The exact punishment that everyone will receive in hell that is only shows up one time on earth. Do you know who gets it? Who is it? Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah. There's never a time when, when fire and brimstone in this sense is spoken of. It is disgusting. It is horrible. It is wicked. It is evil. It is not normal. It is not just an average sin. Yes, we're all sinners, but we're not all sodomites. Get, you are out of your stinking mind if you think these things are normal. Right. You are out of your mind if you think that this is just like the sin that I commit in my life. That is weird and bizarre. It's just, it, it doesn't... You really can't even have words for it. You are not basing your beliefs upon the Bible. That is for sure. Right. The Bible repeatedly says there's greater sins. And the first time you are told about a certain type of people being wicked and sinners exceedingly, who is it? Homosexuals. Right. We see a, a, a very descriptive, I mean extremely descriptive, uh, uh, reprobate mind that is described in Romans 1. And what's attached with it? What is it? A sodomite, a homosexual. Right. I mean, come on. What are these people doing when you see in Genesis 18? What do they do? What do you see take place They're in uh, Genesis 8, 19? I'm sorry, Genesis 19. What happens? Do these seem like normal people? Does this seem like, oh, they're just everyday sinners? Somebody comes in that they don't know, and it's a holy, it's an angel. It's an angel of the Lord. Oh my gosh, an angel of the Lord. Do you know what they want to do? They want to take this angel and rape this angel. They don't know who that angel is. I believe that there are Old Testament appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? You believe that? Right. What if the Lord Jesus Christ would have showed up? You think it would have been any different? Think about that for a minute. You know what they would have tried to do? To God himself? They would have tried. You think it would have been any different? They would have tried to take in the Lord and rape the Lord. Let that blasphemy you know, dwell in your mind for a little while. Just how vile and disgusting and reprobate these freaks are. Right. That's why they didn't receive a second chance. Because this is not normal. This is not just a, just a, we all sin, brother. No, that is not what's going on here. They were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. There are degrees of sin, and you know one of the sins that's wicked and sinners exceedingly? The types of people? Sodomites. Right. Homosexuals. You know the people in the Bible that don't receive second chances? God sends I, I can't, can anyone else think of a, a time in the Bible when God doesn't send a second chance and just destroys the city? I can't think of a time. This is the only time. But what happens? Just blows it off the map of the same thing you find in hell. Right. They died on this earth, burning in fire and brimstone, and immediately, you know what happened? They lift up their eyes like the rich man, and they were in hell. And what were they in? Burning. Like he says, I'm in torment. It's the same exact punishment. The same exact punishment immediately. <coughs> we see that the entire city is corrupted as well. We'll, we'll, we'll see that later, because La, or, uh, Abram is trying to negotiate with the Lord. To try to get them, get God not to destroy the city, as long as there's, you know, he goes through a list of 50 righteous, and he just goes through this big long list. And what do he say? Yeah, I won't destroy if there's 50 righteous. He goes down this big long, there's no one in the city but Lot and his family. That's it. Why? 
Because these, these people are wicked exceedingly. Think about how a sin like that can spread, too. Look around the United States of America and think about how quick that that can permeate the entire culture. That's why we need to make sure that we draw a line between normal sins and, you know, things that are exceedingly wicked. We need to make sure that people know that this is not normal. This is not just something that just everybody, you know, every, all of our sins are the same, whether he's sleeping with another, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. I don't even want to say that it's disgusting. It's, we're, they're all the same. No, they're not. There are horrible sins. There are extremely wicked sins that should just not be put up with at all, period. Amen. That's why there are certain things you get kicked out of the church for and certain things that are just like that's daily sins that everyone commits, right? Obviously, you shouldn't just be going around and that's not you know saying those things are okay either. But there are some sins that are worth being kicked out of the church for and there are some sins that are not. Why? Because they're not the same. They're not the same. And sodomy is not a normal sin. It's exceedingly wicked. <clears throat> Look at verse 14. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Abel, <laughs> After that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. So as soon as Lot leaves, God takes him and says, Lift up your eyes and look in all directions, saying, North, the north, the south, the west, the east, look everywhere. And then he says this <clears throat> in verse 15. For all the land which thou seest to thee, will I give it unto thy seed forever. Verse 16. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So we see the promise of the gospel given one more time. We, we define that. We look in uh, Galatians 3, 16. So that's the Bible's definition that this is the gospel being preached to him right now. Now, one thing that's very interesting is that... <clears throat> There are always types of things, and people will try to apply this promise directly to the physical nation of Israel. Now, it has nothing to do with the physical nation of Israel today, but I believe strongly that there was that the Old Testament nation of Israel, when they were brought in under the Old Covenant, that that was for sure a type of this. And the reason why I say that it was for sure a type, number one, we have this defined as being the, the gospel, it's spiritual. You have the physical nation of Israel fulfilling the physical type, the physical application of the Old Testament. This was never fulfilled fully or in its, in its entirety or completely through the physical nation of Israel. That is a proof of this. If you look there, number one, it says, For all the land which thou seest to thee <coughs> will I give it, and he says, unto thy seed forever. Now, did the Old Testament nation of Israel, did they have the land forever? They did. They lost it many times. They were taken out of there based upon the lack of faith. Not only that, he says that he's going to give all the land. Did they ever possess, ever, all of the land without other people having pieces of property? Think about that. They never did. So Old Testament, you still can't apply this. There are many tribes that were left in that land. You know what else he says there? He says that I'll give this land to you. He says to thee. And to thy seed. You know what that is? That's a further proof that he's not talking about on this land. Because, you know, when you go to Hebrews, let's go there real quick. I may need some help finding this with, uh, with everyone here. If we get there and I can't find it immediately. But he actually tells them, go to Hebrews 11 specifically. Hebrews 11. He tells Abram that, yeah, it's verse number 8. He tells, or he speaks about Abraham here in Hebrews 11. And he, and he says that Abraham never, I think it's this verse, that he never possessed any of this land. Look at Hebrews 11, 8. <clears throat> By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundation, foundations whose builder and maker is God. If you skip down, uh, look at, uh, yeah, just go to the next verse, 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one in him as good as dead, so many as the, the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. <clears throat> Does anybody know where this is? Look at verse, 13. oh, it's verse 13? No, verse 15, 15. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had... No, that's not it. It's 13. Oh, it is 13. 
Thy in faith, not having received the promises. Well, that's not the exact verse I was looking for, but that kind of tells. There's a verse, actually, I'm not exactly sure where it's at, where it specifically says that he never received the land. It actually tells you that he never actually you know, uh, lived and owned and possessed the land. We know that just by, li by reading in the story of Genesis, just by reflecting upon that. But the New Testament even points that specifically out. It says he never possessed that land. He never got it. Because you know what it's trying to point out to you? That this promise was not fulfilled in this life. This promise was not fulfilled physically. It was not of just a physical promise made unto his flesh. Well, it was a spiritual promise made unto a spiritual seed. That's why when you look at this promise, and you look at, let's just look at verse 10, 15. And again, Genesis 13, verse 15, it says this. For all the land which thou seest, seest, notice this, to thee will I give it. So was that portion of scripture right there, was that fulfilled to Abraham while he lived in this life? It wasn't. Well, what makes you think that the next portion was fulfilled for those people while they lived in this life? And then he says, and to thy seed forever. That promise was not a promise that anyone obtains in this life. That is a spiritual promise. We look at, like I said, Galatians 3, we can see that this is a promise, speaking of going to heaven, speaking of being saved spiritually. We see that, he, that the land that he did not get to obtain was not the country that he was actually looking for in the first place. He looked for you know, a land that God had made, that, had, you know, that God built, a city that God had built that had foundations, it says, whose builder and maker is God. That was the actual city that he was looking for. And you know what city that has foundations, more than one? Foundation? New Jerusalem. That's the city that he's actually looking for. That was actually the promised land. The true promised land. You know who actually obtains that land? It was never fulfilled with the physical Israel. You got a big problem, Mr. Zionist. It was never fulfilled. You can say, oh, this is talking about you know, Israel today. It was never fulfilled through Israel. Ever. They didn't receive it and keep it forever. And they never have had all of that land. Ever. Never. People were always dwelling in little pockets of the land where they owned it. You see here, look at verse number 16. I want, I'm going to show you where this is actually in the Bible said to have been fulfilled. Look at verse 16. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So he said, I'm going to make your seed like the dust of the earth. So it's going to be like the dust of the earth. In what way? And he said, he tells you what that means. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So what is his seed going to be like? It's going to be innumerable. You're not going to be able to count his seed. I want you to go to Revelation chapter number 7. Revelation chapter number 7. <coughs> Look at Revelation chapter number 7. We know Revelation at the very end of Revelation 6 is where the rapture takes place. All of the Christians all throughout time who were in Christ, when they were, they were trusting in Jesus, all Christians that have ever lived are resurrected at the very end of Revelation chapter number 6. When they're resurrected and they're, and they're raptured, where do they go? Heaven. They go to heaven. What is in heaven? Paradise. What is it? New Jerusalem. It's that city that Abraham was looking for. The Bible tells you that it's that city specifically. Look where they're at now. Look at verse number 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. Now notice this little detail that you're told. Which no man could number. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Amen. Now, does that, is that a full fulfillment, a complete fulfillment of what we read? When we look over at Genesis chapter number 13, did they have all of the land? Did they have all of New Jerusalem? Was there anyone else dwelling in certain spots that they couldn't have? And let me ask you this too. How long are they going to possess that land? Abraham was resurrected. God told Abraham that I'm going to give this to you and to your seed forever. He said, Abram, think about that. Let that sink down in your ears. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give you this land forever. Forever. He never owned it at all. So when is the only place that this, this could be fulfilled? In heaven. When, when you know, we look at Old Testament Israel, like I said, they never owned all of the land. Do you know, but do you know the people that actually believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and were counted for the seed? Do you know when they get to get that land? When they go to heaven. And do you know how many people were there? They were innumerable. 
go out to the <coughs> Jacksonville beach and try to number the, you know, the, the, the sand that's out there. You think you're going to be able to? You're not going to be able to. That's his point when he says, you know, I want you to look up at the stars. He says that later. That's in Genesis 15. And then right here he just tells him it's just going to be just like the dust. They're going to be innumerable. You see all the Christians who are all in Christ, who are all the seed of Abraham, because they put their faith, they have the same faith as Abraham, they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they believe God, they're counted for the seed, they receive that promise, they're all standing there. You know where they're at? They're in New Jerusalem. You know where they're at? They're in the land of Canaan, the true Canaan, the true promised land, the land that Abram was really searching for, and they're innumerable. That's the only time when that promises ever fulfilled entirely. You know, you have a lot of times with promises and covenants and things in the Bible, you have, they're called, they're called this in theology even, partial fulfillments. The partial fulfillment is a fulfillment that is not in full. The, the shadows, you'll have like the day of the Lord that will take place in the Old Testament immediately when God talks about the day of the Lord coming. You know, in the Old Testament, in Malachi, and these things like that, they'll have an immediate application. But when you look at the prophecy, does it fully line up? It doesn't, does it? So is that the primary application? No, it's just like a picture. It's immediate application, but it's not the full fulfillment. It's not really the fulfillment, is it? It's a partial fulfillment. But then you have the, the actual day of the Lord that all the prophecies are pointing to. And then you really see those things happening, don't you? Right? This right here is a, when you look at Old Testament Israel, that's a partial fulfillment. They never fulfilled all these things. You know where it's actually fulfilled? You know what, where this promise actually takes place? Revelation 7, 9. When you see the great multitude that and he tells you, real clear. He makes sure, God makes sure you understand what, what's happening right now. Hey, it's a multitude that no man can number. They're innumerable. Kind of like the, the sand that's on the seashore. Kind of like the stars in heaven. Kind of like that same promise that was given to Abraham. And you know how long they're going to be there? Forever and ever. Forever and ever. Amen. They're going to possess that land. <clears throat> Abraham finally got to receive that promise when he got to heaven. He never received that while he was on this earth. Nor did anyone that ever lived on this earth. Look there in uh, <coughs> verse number 17. It says this. Arise. Walk through the land and the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So, real quick, I want to show you just educational purposes, uh, give you some uh, education on Hebron. Hebron is a pretty pivotal city in the Bible, pretty uh, uh, famous. If you go to Genesis 23, too, <coughs> we'll look at a couple of places here. Genesis 23, 2, we get another name for Hebron. Genesis 23, 2, it tells you, and Sarah died in Kirjath Arba. So you probably read of Kirjath Arba many times in the Bible. That is, it tells you this, the same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. So notice this is in the land of Canaan. It's referred to as Kirjath Arba. That's where she died. And this is also known as the land of Hebron, isn't it? I want you to go over something very uh, significant. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 31. Genesis chapter 49, verse 31. Yeah, um, it's mentioned many <coughs> times in the Bible. Uh, the land that was <coughs> given unto Caleb from Joshua was the land of Hebron, if you remember that. Um, you know, it's one of the cities of refuge that are, that are dispersed out. It is uh, the portion that's given to them, one of the cities of refuge uh, which the Levites dwell in. Because the cities of refuge were always where the Levites dwelt. And they would go there and be safe with the judge and the, the, the priest. They would keep them safe. Um, there are, uh, I can't remember any, uh, you know, uh, anything else uh, off the top of my head, but there are many more mentions. Oh, David is, is anointed in Hebron. Not only is David anointed in Hebron, he reigns from Hebron for seven years. Yeah, and then he, and then he actually goes and reigns in Jerusalem you know, for the 33 years because he reigned the same amount of time that Saul reigned. They both reigned for 40 years. So he reigned seven years in Hebron. He was anointed in Hebron. It's a very profound city in the Bible. It's spoken of a lot. There's one other thing that's very interesting. It's... Uh, Chapter 49, I believe it's verse, yeah, it's thir at the end of the chapter, <coughs> verse 31. First, look at verse 30. In the cave that is the field of Mechthala, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan. So that sound familiar? We saw that mentioned in Genesis 13. Which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, for a possession of a burying place. And then it says this in verse 31. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. 
There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife, and there I buried Leah. This is Jacob speaking. Jacob ultimately is buried there as well. So all three of the first patriarchal families are all buried in that same place. Now, there's a place where they say still today is that, uh, Hebron, and it very well may be Hebron. You know, I don't know that for a fact. It's south. If you look in the Bible and you study it out, it is south of Jerusalem. Where they say it is, it's south of Jerusalem. They, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's an Islamic state right now, Islamic area. And uh, they say that they know, this right here I doubt very seriously, they say that they know where, you know, uh, the, the cave is, specifically where they're buried. Well, they say that about the tomb of Jesus and a lot of other things, so that's probably not true. I don't know that for a fact. Some things like that are passed down. You know, uh, there's interesting stuff about the, where Noah's Ark landed, and they called that the city of eight. So that kind of, you never know. It's possible. I don't know that for a fact. You know, uh, you can look it up yourself and do your own research, but it definitely is south. In Hebron and Jerusalem, they verified that through archaeology that that is, you know, they know that that's still that is Jerusalem. You know, there's remnants of different things that they've studied and stuff. If you look that up, so Hebron is very, a very profound area in the Bible. Now it was named. Let me see if I have this verse down here. Go to go to Joshua uh, fourteen fifteen. Here's one other reference. I I, I don't think I I wrote this down, so this may not be right, but it's at least another reference that we can look at. Joshua chapter 14, verse 15. I thought that uh, there was a time in which it tells you when it was named, but this may not be it. I might be thinking of another city. Look at Joshua chapter 14. Uh, I'm in Judges. Yeah, whoops. Joshua chapter 14, verse number 15. I'm trying to think about where that's at at the same time while I'm turning here. Joshua chapter 14, verse 15 says, And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. Here it is. Which Arba was a great man. That's right. He's of the Anakims. That's right. Remember this now. Which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. So notice it tells you also, also that it was before Kirjath Arba. It says, and the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. And then it says, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from the war. Now, it was named Kirjath Arba because of the because of Arba was this man. He named it. He was of the Anakims. They were the giants, if you remember them. They dwell in the land of Canaan. So that right there, when that took place, that was when actually when Israel came back after they were in Egypt. So this may have been Hebron prior to them going into Egypt. Then one of the men Arba, you know, the man Arba came of the Anakims and he named it. You know, uh, Arba, or Kirjath Arba it became, or, or I'm not even sure in the Bible what Kirjath means, but it's called Kirjath Arba by this man Arba probably conquering that city. And then maybe they came back in and named it Hebron. I don't believe that's what it is because that's not the pattern of the Bible. Because a lot of times when you look at the names that are used in, <coughs> you know, uh, the early times like with Abraham, what they will call things is what they are called at the time of Moses. That's what they will refer when they say that uh, Abraham goes to this place so and so, like Hebron. That's actually what it's referred to when Moses pinned down that. Now, one of the proofs of that is this. It's very interesting. You can study this out yourself. Is that when did the name Jehovah, when was it first revealed in the Bible? Exodus, Exodus right. It's in the book of Exodus, right? So the, the name, Je yes, it's Exodus 6, I think, verse 4, but it's Exodus 6 for sure. So Exodus 6 is where the name Jehovah is first revealed, right? He said that he was not known by that name. But you know, when you look in your Bible, before Exodus 6, if you look in your Bible, like in Genesis where we're reading, look in Genesis chapter 13, verse 4. Notice what it says at the very end, <laughs> the last clause. And there Abram called on the name of the what? Lord. That's Jehovah. Was Abram calling on the name of Jehovah? Like actually saying Jehovah, the words Jehovah, the name wasn't revealed yet. Jehovah is the person. So over time, so he was calling on Jehovah, the name of Jehovah, but it was God Almighty. You know what another name of Jehovah is God Almighty. I, when I call the name of Jesus, I'm calling on Jehovah, I'm calling on God Almighty. Because that's the new name in the New Testament that's been revealed, right? So we, when we have that right there, him talking about calling on the name of of Jehovah, he was calling on the name, the Bible tells you, of God Almighty. That, that's how, you know, when he actually reveals in Exodus 6 the name that was revealed, he says, 
that, you know, by my name Jehovah, I was not known unto them. He's talking about Abraham. He says, I, when I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, you know, that he's referred to as God Almighty. So what they're actually praying and saying is God Almighty. But when Moses pinned down, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what was the name that they were using for Lord at that time? Jehovah. So he said, what does Jehovah mean? Lord. So when Moses wants to write down the name Lord, what does he write down? He writes down Jehovah. Because the name Jehovah, further proof that the name Jehovah means Lord. But some people will try to argue and dispute that, that in, in Jehovah's Witnesses specifically, that the, the, the word Jehovah from the Hebrew should not be translated as Lord. But you have a big problem when you compare Old Testament and New Testament. I went over that. I'm not going over that again right now because it's kind of in depth. But you also have a problem before the name Jehovah was ever occurring. Because how would you reconcile Moses pinning down that he called on the name Jehovah when it point blank tells you? The only way that you could reconcile that is if Jehovah means Lord. He's calling on the name of the Lord. He's calling on God Almighty, Lord, right? That's the only way that that makes sense. You can't get around that. So what we see here is... When, he, when it's Hebron, my, my opinion, when it's saying that it's Hebron, I believe that it was probably not referred to as Hebron ever until, and I'm not going into this either because if you study the genealogies down the line of Caleb, I believe it's the line of Caleb, but later on there's a man named Hebron that actually once they start you know, dwelling in that land and everything like that, there's a man named Hebron. He was probably named from a family member and stuff like that whose name was Hebron when they took over the city and then they named it Hebron. And when Moses pinned it down, God gave him revelations of what lands that they were going to be receiving. Because he did not, uh, Moses did not go in and actually get that land. So if you remember, he died. So when he pinned this down, God gave him revelations of the land, the names of the different places, all of these things. And he pinned down what that land would be called. So when they read their Bible, the, the, the Israelites, when they were reading what they had as their Bible at that time, it related to where they were living at that time, the words that were using at that time. That's, what Moses, that's why Moses used that. So uh, when we read and study our Bibles, we, need to look, we, need to, we don't need to study like a lot of people try to go to history. You know, try to go to history and see all the You know, if we look at this angle, we can see that Arba, you know, lived at this time. We need to look at the Bible. Any history and any, you know, time in which things are named, we need to go to the Bible and compare things. You can always come out with an answer. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this night, dear Lord. We thank you for your word. We ask you to be with us and bless us, all those that are doing well tonight, dear God, uh, that you would uh, bless the continual study of your word. And, uh, I pray that uh, people learn things tonight, dear Lord. I pray that you would give me wisdom to continue to, to teach your word. And uh, I love you. Just be with us all. Bless our church. Help us to grow. And help us have a sincere heart to continue to serve you in, uh, in truth. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.